All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brittany Card, and I'm a visiting fellow at the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies at Brown University. Thank you for joining us here today for what I know will be an excellent discussion. We are thrilled to host Sarah Petrin, who will share her reflections on what can be done to address the root causes of humanitarian crises. A note before we get started, please submit your questions for Sarah using the Q&A function throughout the event, and we will have ample time for questions and discussion at the end. It is difficult to fully capture the range of Sarah's experience and expertise as she has spent 20 years working in the humanitarian sector. To give you a snapshot, she has served as a peace operations and human security analyst at the US Army War College. She worked as a senior civilian advisor to NATO on the protection of civilians. She has managed programs for refugees and internally displaced people along the borders of Afghanistan, Pakistan, Kenya, Somalia, Thailand, and Burma. And she has also responded to major disasters across the globe, such as the Ebola outbreak, the Southeast Asian tsunami, Hurricane Katrina, and the Haiti earthquake. On top of all of this, Sarah also just recently authored her first book, which is titled Bring Rain, Helping Humanity in Crisis. I can say I read the book this weekend and her insights are analytical, thoughtful, and refreshing. So I think we're in for a great event today. With that, I will turn it over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Brittany. And thank you to Brown University for having me today. I am uh, really happy to join you at this particular uh, juncture in your careers. I know many of you are students who are studying um, humanitarian action. And so I'm going to share with you um, some of my personal reflections about the root causes of humanitarian crises. And these reflections are based on my uh, personal thoughts. And many of them are part of my book, Bring Rain, Helping Humanity in Crisis. And this is just gonna give you a snapshot and an overview of um, those uh, things. And I'm gonna talk for about 20 or 30 minutes, but I really wanna have a dialogue with you and with uh, Brittany as well. Um, to discuss some of the trends in the humanitarian sector and in humanitarian protection and how we can uh, look forward into the future together as an international community. Um, so next slide. Um, so really, I've, I've broken down our discussion today into three different uh, topics. I want to talk about the root causes of humanitarian crisis. Uh, we often hear that root causes are political in nature, and I am going to ask the question, is this really true? Are there really political solutions to the types of crises that we're seeing in the world today? Um, what other solutions are needed? And then I'm going to talk about levels of change. Um, these are levels of change that I lay out in the book about the type of things you can expect to achieve if you select to work in this field as a career. Um, they are levels and not theories of change. Um, so some of you may be studying theories of change, but this is a more basic look at like where, what level of work do I want to commit myself to and why am I picking that particular, particular level of intervention. And then I'm going to speak very briefly to a few protection trends because um, humanitarian protection and refugee uh, crises are my particular uh, technical specialty, um, in addition to peace building and civil military relations. So we're going to touch on those uh, trends really briefly and then open it up to a dynamic discussion. Um, so let's continue to the next slide. As I said, um, when people talk about the root causes of humanitarian crisis, they always say that the solutions are political. But as we see with protracted crises around the world with many conflicts lasting 10 years or more, um, are there really only political solutions to the problem? What other solutions might be available to us other than um, trying to hold elections and have the right type of people in power at the national level, what other types of changes are needed 
um, to address root causes in our sector. Next slide. Um, so in addition to political solutions, which include the importance of good governance, not only at the national level, but at regional and local levels, um, there also needs to be a, a deeper dive on the social and economic root causes of a crisis. And um, to the right here, you see some of the core human rights um, that we look at the basic rights and freedoms, um, the equality and dignity of um, human beings that are affected by conflict and disaster. And I would gather to say that the solutions are not only political, but they exist within society themselves as communities come together um, to protect themselves and to prevent conflict um, within their own communities. And the solutions are often economic. Uh, a lot of our humanitarian frameworks and political frameworks discount the importance of having a functioning economy and having access to finances, access to cash, access to capital. And without this financial component, we see many countries in a post-conflict environment where the population is continuing to be vulnerable and exposed to a number of challenges that if there were the right financial institutions and structures in place, um, they might be able to move on uh, with a little bit of um, capital. Next slide. Um, human rights frameworks are really the basis of all humanitarian work and particularly for the protection sector. And um, I specifically focused my career on forced migration and international refugee law. I uh, did my graduate studies at Oxford in uh, have a master's at the refugee studies program. And so I really focused on uh, international refugee law. And my first um, position when I finished graduate school was managing a UN High Commissioner for Refugee Program uh, with the International Catholic Migration Commission on the Afghan-Pakistan border right after 9-11. Um, and I was there in 2002, 2003, managing cross-border operations. And I have since managed cross-border operations in more than 10 other major uh, refugee uh, crises. Um, but we see particularly in conflict zones that it's important to also have a good understanding and focus on international humanitarian law and the laws of armed conflict, which um, became very important um, to not only the work that I've done in Afghanistan and Pakistan, but also on the Kenya-Somalia border, on the Ethiopia-Somalia border, and on the Thai-Burma border. Um, and we see the importance of understanding uh, the laws of armed conflict when we look at civil military relations and working not only with um, military personnel, but working with police and border patrol and other uniformed personnel that um, are involved in these emergencies. But over time, uh, we've seen that even these international legal frameworks uh, need to be accompanied by international human rights law, including the covenant on economic and social and political rights. Um, and we know that in every context where we have a crisis, um, it seems like the law is insufficient to address the full range of challenges that we face and the implementation of the law is weak. But it's very important to remember that um, the basis of our work is the dignity and the rights of the individual are at the center of our considerations. And this um, includes non-discrimination about um, any form of identity of that particular individual. Next slide. Um, so I just bring up this egg model of humanitarian protection because protection is um, my sector of expertise and I, I know that you've recently had some great guest speakers on humanitarian protection, but I am um, not going to cover everything about this model, um, only to say that when humanitarians look at uh, protection, the law is at the center of all the work and what um, often challenged me, um, next slide. 
um, throughout my career in every assignment that I had um, on the ground in a crisis, whether it was a conflict or a major disaster, was the gap between the protection mechanisms that we have available to us and the reality on the ground. And I'm borrowing this slide also from a, a guest lecture I gave at the Navy War College uh, last week. Um, Brittany and I discussed it, and I, I think it's very important to recognize the gaps that exist in the field. And these may be oversimplified, but having worked in more than 20 countries, we I see these gaps over and over again. And so it's important to point them out that even though we have the rule of law and in some degree in every context, um, we also see weak courts and traditional justice mechanisms that really don't um, see the individual with all the full rights and dignity and equality that we would like to see. Um, the institutions that we rely on for social services are malfunctioning or non-existent. And we often talk about government services, but also those institutions can be private institutions. As I mentioned, we, we fail to recognize the importance of the financial sector. And if there aren't functioning banks and a formal economy, um, then people have to rely on cash and bartering and exchange. And sometimes um, aspects of uh, the black market economy, which are exploitative and um, harmful uh, to individuals and uh, to groups of people. Um, we see a security sector that is itself at times corrupt or perpetrating violence against particular individuals. Uh, we see infrastructure that is damaged or collapsed and that infrastructure um, can't be repaired without significant finances again and government commitment um, to uh, prioritize reconstruction is also missing in certain contexts. Um, I already talked a lot about the financial means because I think it's a, it's a gap that we don't talk about enough in our work. And social cohesion is often missing uh, in a community that has been fractured by divisions and where violence can occur not only uh, with between armed groups but within communities themselves that are um, in conflict with one another. Next slide. So in my, um, early in uh, my work in this field, I was really uh, caught up in the dilemma of physical protection. Um, having had all the training in international refugee law and human rights law and humanitarian law, I was really um, scratching my head about where does the physical protection come from? After working on the ground in about, um, you know, 10 different locations. I personally was um, tired of seeing people die, seeing people killed, um, seeing people raped, captured, kidnapped, um, injured and maimed. And I was very concerned about the physical integrity of the people that I was meant to serve in my career. And uh, when it comes to the question of who is keeping people safe, we know that there are protection actors in uh, the security sector who have the responsibility for physical protection and that that includes police and military, border patrol, government officials and national laws sometimes are protective and sometimes are persecutory of the population. Um, but in reality, when we look at certain conflicts today, we see that um, these protection actors are often local leaders and militia groups that are local loosely affiliated with any formal governance structures. And we often see individual persons who are armed or unarmed at any given time who may um, be fighting one moment and not fighting the next moment. And so this reality on the ground is that we have um, armed actors that are um, not necessarily affiliated with any armed group, but have the potential to cause harm. And this is a concern. And then we also see a fracturing of the economic, political, and social structures. And I mention this because even if we have the right government officials in place at the national level, without the social communal structures and the economic and financial mechanisms, we often see these gaps continue to persist. Next slide. Um, I'm going to shift topics a little bit now, um, although I'm happy to entertain questions about um, what I mentioned about root causes and gaps. 
Um, because one thing that my book Bring Rain hopes to achieve is to break down um, the complexity of the humanitarian sector uh, for your everyday person, uh, whether you're a student or a volunteer or a donor who, who may not um, commit your whole career to the humanitarian sector, um, but you wanna do something to make a difference. And so I try to lay out um, four levels of change of what one person can hope to achieve. This is what you as an individual might uh, want to ask yourself as you continue to uh, make decisions about your own personal path in this sector. Next slide. So the first question um, that I like to bring up in the chapter on achieving your vision is why do you want to make a difference? And I think it's really important, particularly in today's world, to assess your motivations and also to assess the skills that you need to be successful in the sector. And I just lay out five really basic questions that I think is important for every person who endeavors to uh, do this work. Uh, one, what is motivating me to do this work? Uh, where, where is my source of inspiration coming from? And am I the right person to do this work? Um, there are many people who think they want to work in conflict zones, for example, and then when they are in an austere environment or when they are in an area where there is active fighting between groups of people, um, it's very stressful and very difficult. And also in many remote locations, um, you won't have access uh, to food and water and electricity and your own basic needs might be compromised. And not everyone can work in these austere environments, even though you might think that it would be really uh, romantic in some ways, sometimes it's actually uh, quite difficult to, uh, to work in those environments. And it's not for everyone, particularly if you have um, a medical condition or other uh, constraints that would make it very difficult for you to get help um, if you're far away from uh, your own support mechanisms. Third, I think it's really important to ask yourself, um, what problem am I trying to address? Um, when you're only one individual and you're starting out in this field, you can't address every problem that you see. And for me in particular, I was very initially motivated to help uh, refugees. I was, uh, I was born in Kenya to parents who were serving as um, a teacher and a nurse. And um, I went back to Kenya when I was young and I tried to help build a school in the community where I was born. And at the time, uh, Somali refugees came and squatted on the land. And having these face-to-face -face encounters um, with Somali refugees um, back in the early 1990s uh, was what motivated me to help refugees. But then the more I helped refugees, the more I tried to address that problem of physical protection and that led me uh, to do more civil military uh, work. Um, and then asking yourself, what solution are you trying to achieve? Because sometimes we have a vision of what we think is possible, but it may not be um, possible for us as individuals uh, to reach a certain end state. So for example, when I was working with uh, refugees, I really wanted to work toward durable solutions um, to helping populations return home, um, to helping vulnerable refugees get resettled. And coming up with a durable solution takes time. It can take uh, two to five to 10 years to help a population repatriate or resettle. Um, so understanding what the nature of the solution is and how long it takes to achieve that solution will give you realistic expectations of how to set yourself up um, for doing the work. And then how will things change as a result of my success? And here I say my success intentionally because I'm talking about you as an individual. And um, the reality is that the humanitarian sector is not a go it alone business. You absolutely must team up with a good 
a group of people. You must work within a good institution. Uh, you have to have good relationships with communities and partners and donors, and you have to be able to work with so many people um, to uh, actually achieve something on the ground. Um, you cannot do very many things as an individual. And this can be very frustrating to some people who are super goal oriented, who like to tick the boxes. So how are you gonna adjust yourself to realize that your success depends on so many factors beyond your control and how are you going to build the teams of people and the networks of partners that you need to feel like you're actually making a difference. Next slide. Um, so one thing that I suggest in the book that we don't have time to do today, but I would love to come do a workshop with you at Brown on forming a personal vision statement uh, for your life mission. And every organization or agency that you're ever going to work for, or even if you go into the private sector and have a corporation um, that you work for, they're going to have a vision statement, a goal statement. Um, but what I suggest in the book is that you develop a personal vision statement for your life mission. And part of the reason that I suggest this is that humanitarian work is really hard. Um, it is difficult to see the end state and to have a sense of achieving success. And so at every stage of my career, I tried to develop my own mission statement of what I was personally trying to achieve as a way of helping guide my own motivation uh, for doing this work. And so when I was in my 20s, my motivation and my mission was about standing in the gap the gap between people that had needs and the ability to meet those needs. So I was very involved in hands-on humanitarian delivery. I was very involved in hands-on assistance to communities and groups of people. And then in my thirties, I changed my uh, vision statement. And the book tells the story about this, that um, this idea of protecting the people became very critical to me um, particularly responding to a disaster in the United States um, when Hurricane Katrina hit uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. I had uh, come back from Afghanistan and Pakistan and working with the UN and I was working with an NGO that um, senior government officials um, called my boss and said, will you send Sarah down to New Orleans? and ask her to assess uh, the situation of people displaced um, by the storm. And when I got down to uh, the command center in Baton Rouge, I was in uh, really complete shock, even though for those of you who might remember on the news at the time, um, people were trying to be rescued from their rooftops after the levees broke. There, everywhere was inundated with flooding, the hospitals lost uh, power and uh, were also flooded uh, with patients, but people were going to um, the Superdome and trying to get shelter there. And when I arrived in Baton Rouge and I tried to assist people, um, I immediately had uh, people who were completely naked uh, coming up to me, asking me where they could find clothes to clothe themselves because they had lost everything in the storm. And I, every corner that I went to had uh, families of four and six uh, people sleeping out of their cars in vacant lots because they could not um, be in their homes. And it was just devastating to me um, to see the lack of physical protection for people in the United States. And I tell the story of trying to get supplies like water um, to people in shelters and how awful it was and difficult it was. And it, it really showed me the systemic discrimination and racism that occurs in the United States and uh, within communities of color. And uh, that's where my vision for protecting people um, became uh, front and center of, of my work. And I also formed an organization called Protect the People um, after that. And then in, in my 40s, which I'm now in my 40s, 
Um, I wrote Bring Rain really to motivate and educate and inspire people to do the work and join the work. Um, I think once you've worked in this sector for 20 years, you realize there aren't enough of us um, to do the work, then we need more people to address the problems we see in the world. And I have been teaching at the Army War College and teaching at other undergraduate institutions. And so I think it's really important that we share the knowledge from our work and we engage more people in, um, in trying to help humanity. Next slide. Um, so in the book, you'll see about um, achieving your vision. I, I give these four levels of change. Again, they're not theories of change. They're just levels for your consideration about how you want to make a difference. And I, I state that really um, everyone can make a difference in individual lives. And I try to tell the story of people in the book who I know I made an impact in their individual life. And it doesn't take a professional technical expertise to help an individual person. Anyone can do it. And there are people that come across our lives every day that we can help as individuals. And I, I tell stories of how I volunteered early in my life as a young person. And I was a literacy volunteer and helped people learn how to read. And that helped me realize that even in my home state where I am, my community where I come from, there are vulnerable people um, who didn't finish their education for various reasons and who needed help with just even the basics of reading street signs so they could drive. Um, so anyone can help an individual and some people that love working with individuals might be called to um, different types of careers um, than those who wanna help groups of people. And a lot of my career has been spent helping groups of people like refugees and specific populations in need, such as vulnerable groups, including migrants, victims of human trafficking, people affected by sexual violence and other forms of gender-based violence. And you can help these groups of people by having very targeted interventions that focus on a particular area of need. So some people focus on vulnerable children um, others might focus on um, certain ethnic uh, groups or linguistic groups. Um, there's many different types of groups of people that you can choose to serve in your career. But also helping communities is really important. And one thing I love about um, the examples in the book is community level transformation really happens from within the communities themselves. And the greatest kinds of change happen when communities are empowered to develop their own solutions. And so I tell a story in the book about a, a women's cooperative in Zambia that I served on their board, that they uh, were very affected by HIV AIDS and people getting sick in their community. And um, the women were part of a micro enterprise project that helped them have income. But once they actually earned enough money, they pooled that money together and they made just this epic decision that I uh, love to tell the story. The women bought out the, the brothel in the middle of their town and it wasn't easy. The owner didn't just give them the brothel. I mean, he was running prostitution rings, drug rings, um, all the things that were causing the spread of HIV AIDS in these women's lives um, were coming at, they saw the brothel as the source of their insecurity and they pulled their money together and they bought it out. And today that brothel is a community center with a safe space for children with micro enterprise projects with a uh, playground. And it's where everyone goes to celebrate uh, things together as a community. And they did that themselves with their own money, with their own work. And so community level transformation is so uh, wonderfully empowering and restorative when you can be part of um, fostering those local solutions. And then really probably one of the more difficult things to achieve is country level change. Uh, when you wanna influence uh, policy at a country level or you wanna influence reconstruction at a national level, often this involves uh, political level negotiations and I give the example of Rwanda as a country that has made a really great transition from uh, being in uh, ethnic conflict to 
um, building a sense of community within uh, the country and also investing in agriculture as a way of helping people get out of poverty. And those investments in agriculture have just um, created opportunities for everyday people to have greater income. And that income brings agency and that agency reduces dependency on aid. And so there's country level transformation that often involves working with larger institutions and broader policy frameworks. And so I think as a humanitarian, you can work at all these different levels, but not at the same time <laughs> and not all at once. Um, you often have to choose what problem you're addressing, what level of change you're trying to work toward. And a lot of those decisions depend on your own motivation and your own sense of purpose and mission in, in your life. Next slide. Um, so I'm just gonna pause there. I know that was a lot of self-reflection that hopefully um, uh, got you thinking for the Q&A and discussion. Um, but I'm just going to shift again to uh, what is really the third topic for today, uh, which is just addressing a few protection trends that we see. And uh, the question that I have here is, um, what in the world is going on? And when I was writing my book, um, this book is not for uh, academic experts, it's for a public audience. And um, one of the publishers suggested that we title it, What in the World is Going On? And I thought, well, I can't explain everything, but <laughs> um, maybe we can double down on a few major trends that are happening um, from my perspective. Next slide. Um, so this slide comes from the Uppsala Conflict Data Program in Sweden, which is one of the world renowned um, sources of data on uh, the types of violence going on in the world. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend a study that came out in uh, June of uh, 2020 that is uh, covering 10 years of conflict trends. And in my view, it is the best analysis I've seen in a very long time of um, trends in conflict analysis. And so I show this slide um, that talks about the fatalities of those affected by armed conflict. And what's really um, kind of shocking about uh, their research is that in the last 10 years, we've had 2.5 million people die as a result of conflict. And the way Uppsala uh, manages uh, data, it does not assign blame to any particular party. Um, so this is not like a civilian casualty chart, um, but it is looking at all types of um, deaths caused by conflict and it excludes Rwanda. So if we included the Rwanda genocide, um, this chart would be uh, even more uh, fatalities um, and it kind of skews um, the results, but um, this 2.5 million figure excludes the Rwanda genocide. Next slide. So as, as I said, when we look at protection trends, we have to think about the death toll from conflict and how do we make war less deadly? And right now the tools we have in place on uh, the laws of armed conflict and inter international humanitarian law, I think are just part of the tools that we need to make war less deadly. I think there are probably some other tools that we could look at. And then when we look at the death toll from COVID, um, more than 2 million people globally have now died from COVID and health security and global pandemics is a, not only an emerging field, but it's a transformative field for our sector. Um, no one was prepared for COVID. Um, even in the United States, we haven't had the type of response that I think anyone is particularly proud of. Although uh, many people, including Brittany, are working around the clock on vaccines and uh, vaccine access. And um, there is a lot of good work going on. But what I see from COVID is a, a system, particularly in the United States, where there's too much competition between uh, the federal and the state level of response and too much politics going on between states 
and differentiation in policies. And we really don't have very good national protocols for managing disaster in the United States. And I think that this leads us to a humble place when it comes to foreign aid, that we don't have all the solutions, even when we experience a challenge in our own country, we have to be more inclusive. We have to listen to communities on the ground and we have to focus more on the vulnerable populations that need the help the most. So we have to take in the own, our own lessons that we're giving to other countries and uh, create a better disaster response system in the United States as well. And we have a lot of environmental challenges. And I put on here the question, do we believe that climate change is real? And I asked that um, in a very tongue in cheek kind of way, because what I observe in, from my perspective is that people write a lot of things about climate change. Um, they write a lot of papers about the link between environmental degradation and uh, conflict. But the work going on in the countries that are vulnerable to um, major uh, disasters uh, from environmental changes is kind of minuscule uh, compared to what we believe the need will be. And so I just think that we're also ill prepared for this scope and severity of what environmental challenges we face. And I don't see the level of investment in uh, local solutions that I think are needed. And also we in the protection sector um, are still very focused on armed actors and armed groups. And um, we're very focused on the way the military behaves and changes we would like to see in uh, armed groups. But um, even within the military, there is more of a focus on a future environment where threats to the population come from uh, things that are not even human and not even associated with armed groups. Um, threats that come from technology, from artificial intelligence, from uh, cyber interventions. And these can affect the most basic types of infrastructure, including power supply, water supply, communications, and a number of other things. And so I think that um, as a humanitarian sector, we have not yet really truly looked at all of the threats to human beings um, in the future that we could be looking at more, um, more seriously. Next slide. This chart is um, a framework that is getting a lot of discussion um, within civil military dialogue. Um, it's a human security framework that was first established by the United Nations uh, Development Program in its 1994 Human Development Report. And now we see uh, in NATO that there is a human security unit at headquarters in Brussels and um, even at the Army War College. Um, I also was a human security analyst. So we looked at this framework as a potential framework for addressing a broader range of threats to human beings um, than maybe even what our current legal uh, frameworks offer, which is looking at seven aspects of human uh, vulnerability and insecurity and risk and looking at ways of addressing each one. Um, so the personal security is more about interpersonal violence. So in, in this category, we would put forms of um, interpersonal violence and maybe aspects of uh, criminal behavior. Um, community level security, again, addressing violence within communities and civilian on civilian harm. Uh, that's uh, as a result of social divisions. Uh, food insecurity, which is very important uh, without investments in agriculture. Uh, communities will continue to be dependent on food aid, uh, which is not good for the market economy. And so we really need to encourage investments in agriculture at the national level in every country that's vulnerable to a crisis. 
Um, the environment, uh, we already discussed climate change, the political security situation we know, and the health issues are very evident. And then again, the economic piece, which I have seen as such a critical aspect of human recovery that, um, and financial recovery for communities that without investments in finance and institutions like banking and making that accessible to the population, um, they often don't experience personal economic growth in a way that reduces their individual vulnerability. So that is a framework. Um, that is being looked at by a lot of governments and militaries around the world right now as a way of broadening the scope of threats that we're trying to address in the world today. Next slide. Um, so what are our humanitarian solutions to all these big problems? Um, one reason why I also wrote Green Rain is because the size of the humanitarian sector, in my view, is insufficient to meet the challenges of our day. There are probably only about 10,000 professional humanitarian workers in our sector whose everyday job it is, is to help humanity. And there are many other sectors and many other types of professions that can contribute to addressing these problems. And as humanitarians, we need to embrace them, including peace building communities, um, long term economic development communities, and um, many other sectors that we don't view as partners like the financial sector. Um, and inviting them in to help be part of the solution, I think, is really important. In my view, there just aren't enough of us um, to address these big picture problems. And then law as the basis for protection, I think is a good foundation, um, but what more is required? How else can we address um, human vulnerabilities um, when those vulnerabilities might come from things that are not human, that can't be identified or traced to a particular person or place? Um, how can we keep people safe from harm um, when there is no particular person to hold accountable for that harm? And this is a huge challenge for the future environment. And also we know um, that during the World Humanitarian Summit some years ago now, there was a huge emphasis on localization and the grand bargain for developing solutions um, at the local level. And there just hasn't been the investment that is needed um, in local solutions and local actors. And um, part of the reason that investment hasn't been made is that our financing mechanisms are biased um, through Western donors who want to do things a certain way. And uh, that way is not always compatible with the capability of local actors on the ground. Um, so we have to find new ways of doing humanitarian financing if we're gonna make localization a reality. And we have to expand our idea about who is a humanitarian and what humanitarian work is so that we can help um, come up with big picture solutions um, to these big picture problems. And with that, I will just pause um, so we can have a discussion and you can uh, switch to the next slide. Thank you. Sarah, thank you so much for that overview. I have to say, I really do appreciate the opportunity to both look at thematic trends, but also your strategies on being reflective on one's own role and the work that we're doing and contributing to the humanitarian sector, because you are right, the needs are immense and the work cross cuts so many other sectors and types of work and there's there's not one type of job uh, when you work in this sector so finding what is best and also where you can make the greatest impact so we have some really excellent questions in the queue but i'm going to use my power as moderator to kick us off and ask you the first question because it would be a missed opportunity not to have you talk about your experience in civil military relations a bit more in depth just Based on your time working with militaries around the world, I will only ask you if you would offer some thoughts on the US military's understanding and perspectives 
on the protection of civilians and human security more broadly from what you've seen? Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Brittany. I think, um, you know, I have been at the Army War College for the last two years, um, working in the Peacekeeping and Stability Operations Institute. And um, in that capacity, I've also worked um, to help prepare US officers who are going into UN peacekeeping missions. And I've also liaised with NATO, um, who I worked with uh, prior to coming um, to, to the War College. And now I'm really speaking in my personal capacity, but I think that um, in the last um, 10 years, we've seen a lot of challenges to the protection of civilians in operations. And um, certainly if we go back to that Uppsala uh, study that I showed the chart in, uh, last year, the greatest number of uh, civilian fatalities was in Afghanistan. And we know this is one of the longest standing conflicts that the US and NATO uh, allies have been involved in. And so for the civilian population in Afghanistan, this long war has not become less deadly. It's become even more deadly and more uh, difficult for them to carry on their normal life. And I think just like humanitarians get compassion fatigue, I think that the military can also get protection fatigue in a way because um, they know that the protection of civilians is important, but they're all really uh, hungry for the end state. Uh, they're ready for the war to end. Uh, we have to remember that our uh, military uniformed officers, many of them have been deployed in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria and many other locations um, multiple times in the last 10 years. And so for them, this idea that things never change, that the war never ends, that they're constantly working on the same problems, that no one is addressing the big picture solutions, um, I think is also very frustrating for officers. And so um, when they're criticized by the humanitarian community for not being able to realize the protection outcome, I think um, this leads to frustration because they also need to see the political solution, right? We, we say the solutions are political, so why should we expect the military to solve a war? We need not only uh, governments to commit to peace, but we need society and we need the financial uh, realization of economic development for people on the ground so that they can uh, provide for their own future. So I think this is complex and, um, and at the moment there is a bit of a fatigue with the idea of protecting civilians as maybe something that is mission impossible. Excellent, thank you. And I would also just reflect, I think, from my time at the U.S. Naval War College, it became clear that finding ways to promote constructive criticism, but also creating avenues for constructive dialogue and having safe spaces where humanitarians and military actors could come together and have difficult conversations, um, because it can be, you know, emotions can run high, people are committed to the work that they're doing, and like you said, there are, are bigger forces at play, but everyone is working to, to meet their mission and their objective. So I think related to that, we had an excellent question of how did you deal with frustrations emanating from situations where you could have intervened and you felt like you could have done more, but your hands were tied by bureaucracy, politics, policies, and other things in place that prevented you from doing the work you wanted? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think for everyone uh, working in this sector, um, particularly if you want to have a long career in this sector, you really have to realize right away um, that some of the changes you want to see are going to take a long time. And this is really frustrating, right? Because oftentimes, particularly if you're managing an emergency program, if you're on a short-term contract and you have an infusion of money and an infusion of direct assistance to give to people, and then you realize that um, you're gonna have to address some deeper vulnerabilities. So I think about the tsunami in Thailand and um, 
when I arrived in Thailand after the tsunami, my mission was to focus on the Burmese population from Myanmar, who were both migrants and refugees, some of whom were um, domestic workers and trafficking victims and things like this. And it, it was very evident that um, they were not able to access assistance, even by major humanitarian agencies that we all respect. They were leaving them out because they were not citizens and they were using a national registry to um, you know, tick off the box of which families and households got assistance. And this meant that hundreds of thousands of migrants and refugees were uh, left out of national assistance mechanisms. And as humanitarian coordinators, we should know better. We should be looking for these uh, vulnerabilities in the system and addressing them. But it was very difficult for me um, to convince other agencies to do things for non-nationals at the time. And so we had to establish our own programs and um, we had to work directly with the authorities in the Thai government and convince them to help this population that they really uh, saw it as a lesser uh, group of human beings that they didn't have the same rights and the same protections. And you have to sometimes do the uncomfortable work of advocating for people in a way that is, um, it, it, it's not always easy, right? To um, bring up things that are happening to people um, in these environments, it puts you also sometimes at risk when you're not sure how the authorities are gonna view you by bringing up these violations, but um, you have to be willing to put yourself out there and you have to be willing uh, to do the advocacy that leads to policy change. And I think building on this idea of humanitarian strategies, how can we shift the humanitarian focus from one that is often reactive to a more proactive and preventative posture. And I think especially considering that a lot of humanitarian issues can be rooted in and exacerbated by colonial traumas. Can, sorry, Brittany, can you repeat the beginning part of the question? Yeah, just thinking about strategies for humanitarian organizations, how can they shift from being more reactive to proactive and preventative in their work? Yeah, I really think that eventually, you know, um, agencies need to link up with the economic development and peace building communities. And this is easier said than done. I mean, we know some agencies are doing this, like Mercy Corps, for example, is doing a great job at looking at deeper conflict trends and uh, working toward uh, peace. Um, in communities and other agencies are less focused on this longer term work. I think we're also starting to see some encouraging pro projects between the World Bank and major humanitarian agencies um, in the UN. And this is also super promising because it provides a chance to do long term uh, funding agreements for more um, systemic um, changes in infrastructure, access to healthcare, access to housing, um, things that are beyond the scope of what humanitarians can do with short-term aid. So I think there are some promising things that are happening in the sector. And um, I think one thing that, that could be done better is uh, for all donors to encourage uh, countries that have recurring vulnerabilities and disaster to establish their own humanitarian system. Um, there's a lot of criticism about foreign aid and the neo-colonial approach. And I think really the best way to address this is to make foreign aid less foreign altogether. And for national governments to take some measure of greater responsibility of coordinating their own national actors and also ensuring that the international work is part of a broader strategy um, for the good that they're doing um, within their own uh, governments. And this is, this is a struggle, as we know, some governments are, are better at um, providing uh, protection for their population than others. Um, but I think every government needs a humanitarian system. And if we really believe it, that the current challenges we face are global, um, then no one is immune to a crisis. 
and every every person should have the ability uh, to receive help. And why should this help be foreign? Um, it it could be a national system in in every location around the world. So I'm going to attempt to break down a very long and complex question, but it relates to this and. The question is that you describe humanitarian and human rights issues as entwined and that the work of those two fields is blended in a way. So the question is, are there benefits to a more explicit distinction between the professions of humanitarianism and human rights, meaning that it could allow for aid workers to focus more on core skills and enabling life sustaining relief? while humanitarian professionals can then work on addressing the challenges uh, facing individual dignity? Uh, well, I mean, like I said, you have to choose, right? If you're one individual, like in, in my career, I haven't had just one type of humanitarian career. And some people, you know, who are really against working with the military would say that's not even humanitarian uh, work doing civ mill coordination. As you know, some people feel very strongly um, about not coordinating at, at all with the security sector. And so I think that, you know, people have different ideas about what humanitarians should and shouldn't be doing. And that's why it's really important for you as an individual to have um, a vision. So if you want to focus on human rights, um, you can study law and become an attorney and you can do programming, you can do advising, you could run for office yourself, you could serve in government yourself. There's so many things you can do, you know, with a law degree. But if you, if you really want to work at the intersection of humanitarian work and human rights, you can also be an advocate and work on humanitarian access and diplomacy. And certainly I've spent a good amount of my career in Washington, D.C., where I am uh, right now near the nation's capital. And I have spent a lot of time advocating for more money for disasters, more responses to local communities and um, solutions for refugees and things like that. So I think that, you know, if you think of your lifetime as decades of work, you can probably do more than one thing. Uh, in your lifetime, but you should know why you're doing it and um, and be willing to make a transition, you know, if you're experiencing frustration and um, maybe just dig into that and, uh, and try to find another way to channel uh, your desire to make a difference. So we have time for one last question, and it's one that I think actually ties in quite well to the themes in your book around faith and religion. And the question was if you can offer reflections on religion as a contributing factor or a solution to conflict. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, there is a chapter in the book about keeping faith in humanity, which uh, shares my own um, Christian faith tradition, but also expresses um, the importance of respecting people of other faiths and working alongside people of all faiths, um, which you will do as um, you travel and, and do this work in different environments. You, you will come across many different ways of um, thinking about faith and faith practices. And it's true that at times we see um, faith traditions and religious uh, practices that are harmful to the human rights of individuals and groups and communities. And then at other times we see ways of bringing um, people of faith and leaders in the community together um, to work against uh, a particular practice. So what's coming to mind um, in this regard is you know, the practice of uh, female genital mutilation and gender-based violence and sexual violence, that these are often taboo topics in, in almost any uh, faith tradition, but bringing people of faith together to talk about it can help reduce um, instances of violence and help prevent violence. Um, but there are many other uh, examples like in South Sudan, uh, we see the importance of the church and religious leaders in peace building and trying to 
uh, find a solution to ethnic uh, conflict in South Sudan. So I think that it can um, it can be both a, a good force for bringing people together, and it can also be a restrictive force that um, infringes upon individual rights. And so when you're in the field, don't shy away from engaging with religious leaders um, as one of many uh, potential partners for achieving uh, your program goals. Well, we are at time and Sarah, just thank you so much for your time today and also for your work. Uh, we were really happy to host you here and just a huge heartfelt thanks from the center here at Brown. Thank you so much, Brittany. And if anyone has more questions, you can submit them um, to me on my website, sarahpetran.com, or you can find me on, on LinkedIn uh, where I tend to be more responsive to uh, messages. So thank you so much, Brittany, and um, best of luck to all of you as you finish your spring term. Thank you, everyone. Bye.